Welcome to Uncluttered and Unfiltered, the podcast urging you to let it go and don't look back with nationally acclaimed professional organizer, Christine Stone, and self-proclaimed hot damn mess radio and TV personality, Eden Kendall. Welcome everybody. It is another episode of Uncluttered and Unfiltered with me, Eden Kendall, and Christine Stone of Neatly Designed. Hey everyone, glad to be back. So we have talked for a while about doing an episode centered around the A word. Yes. The A word is anxiety. And I personally don't know anybody who could tell me honestly they don't ever experience anxiety. Do I you? No, I don't. Everybody has some sort of anxiety. I don't know if this is a technical thing or, and we'll, we can certainly find out, but it, you know how they have the pain scale in the hospital, yes. the one to 10 pain scale, where are you? And then you have to kind of assess yourself and say, well, I'm right. a seven today. On a scale of one to 10 daily with anxiety, some of us carry more than others. Right. Some of us have what on the surface looks like more of a reason to have that anxiety, right. but that's not always no. what is the case. No. No, I agree. So we wanted to have somebody join us that could not just discuss how normal it is to feel these feelings, but discuss ways to handle them. And my friend, Dr. Gwendy Cohen, checks all the boxes because she is a woman in her 50s. So she is our people. Yes. And she is a clinical psychologist. And she is a, a proponent of cognitive behavioral Therapy. Is that correct, Wendy? It is. It is. And evidence-informed therapy for the most part. So there's research that supports these types of therapies. So is that accurate to say that most of us, if not all of us, do experience a level of anxiety? It's completely accurate because it's a natural emotion. We all experience emotions and we're not picking and choosing them. I always like to say if there was a line for all the emotions, there'd be a lot of people in some of them and nobody in the other ones. And so they just naturally occur for us, sort of like body sensations. Well, when I was thinking about some of the things that trigger anxiety in me or friends, you know, you're always talking to your girlfriends or somebody about what triggers their anxiety. The first thing I thought of, when did my anxiety really seriously begin? And it was perimenopause. And until I went to a female doctor, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with male doctors, but did she say you're in perimenopause and anxiety is a huge key thing that I hear about a lot. I actually almost immediately felt better because there was somebody validating how I was feeling, but people don't realize perimenopause is a big anxiety trigger going on in your life, in that phase of your life. So I think we could refer to it really as hormones. So hormones can exacerbate our experience of anxiety. I mean, our body is going through a lot of changes. Also the experiences that we have. And so it's very individualized. People start experiencing anxiety immediately when they're young because it is a normal emotion. And the way we process things has something to do with our life experiences, so environment or nurture, and biological um, components of ourselves, right, or nature. And that influences how we take in things from outside of us. So you could have five people in a room experience the same thing and each person will process it differently. That's why if you've ever been in a room with friends and something happened and then you start talking about it afterwards and you're like, were you in the same situation as me? Yes. Like what was going on? And I think that's super important to recognize because when we start thinking about how to cope with these different things, we need to realize that the coping is also gonna be individualized. So like one thing that I love that you said, Eden, was that rating scale for pain. And it does become really important for somebody to understand themselves, understand what is my five? Like at five, I am functional, but I'm experiencing anxiety. And maybe that's the correct or accurate or appropriate emotion for the situation at hand. Well, if that is true, your goal is not to get rid of the anxiety. Your goal is to accept this is a situation that generates anxiety within me. How am I going to manage this? So instead of thinking all or none, like I'm going to have it, I'm not going to have it. We want to think in terms of how am I going to effectively manage this anxiety so that I can get that scale to a place where I'm functional. Is it plausible, though, to think like with what 
Chris was saying about um, perimenopause, to think that your scale can change because of your hormones. So in other words, something that 10 years ago or even five years ago or two years ago have left you at a three, level three, that same exact situation suddenly has you wanting to strangle somebody. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it can affect, by our biology can affect us in relation to all of our emotions, but in terms of anxiety, if you are hormonally in a place where, um, for lack of better words, you're on edge or you're feeling edgy, then your baseline is higher. So a way to real, or your, um, your starting point, excuse me, is higher. So a way to think about it is, whereas I used to kind of flow around a two and that's where I was all of the time, now I sort of flow around a five. Right. There's a lot less room for that to trigger you to go to a space where you don't feel functional. Yeah, and I hear so many women in the beginning of the perimenopause, because that can last years, yes. you know, thinking there's something wrong with them and there's nothing wrong with them. It's just like you said, they used to be a two, but now everything is the end of the world or everything it's coming in them, hot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and everything makes yeah. you cry or everything makes you mad or, you know what I mean? You know, an early example of that, of course, is for women um, prior to perimenopause, as you're in your cycle and you get closer um, to when you're going to menstruate, you'll see those changes as well. Some people have a harder time with it than others. The same thing as perimenopause and menopause. Right. We all, expl we all um, feel it and experience it differently, but there's a lot of evidence that shows the hormones play a role. I remember a very famous trial where PMS, a defense for murder. It was brought up on trial. Your husband's a defense attorney, <laughs> ask him. And that's because hormones are so triggering in those situations, yeah. right? Yeah, and diagnostically, um, you can find things in the DSM, such as like... Um, uh, uh, Wait, what's the, DSM? The Diagnostic St Statistical Manual. So oh. it's what we use to diagnose, oh. right? And there are specific diagnoses that refer to depression related to those types of things and such. So, yeah. Hmm. yeah. So other things that I know that um, we talked about, Christine and I talked about things like um, social media, and um, just the pressure of the world out there. You had you had a really well written question that you had. Well, that. mine isn't just social media. It's the news. Mm. It, it's every morning, every night, all day long. You should be skinnier. You should be prettier. You should be careful. You're going to get sick. You know, there's always something that has you on red alert. I call it. It's mm. like the minute you think, oh, that's that's behind me something else will come. I mean, anything from the news, you could just be watching, like if someone passes away at a young age, you're like, do I have that? Could I get that? Mm -hmm. My husband will always turn to me and say, how did he get that? I'm like, I don't know. It's a disease, I guess. Like you you automatically bring it back to you. Yeah, it's, it's like information overload. And um, as technology has grown, that has grown as well. Uh, and in terms of that, we want to remember that personalizing things, um, woulda, coulda, shouldas, those are all um, thought distortions. Mm -hmm. So when we say, I should be this, well, we, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, but if we aren't, we aren't, and if we are, we are. So that really speaks to the importance of having realistic expectations for self and also acceptance related to self, others, world, you know, situations. Life and stress are a package deal. There's yep. nothing a person's going to do to be able to control that. And um, But how we react and respond to that, that's our place of empowerment. And one thing we want to be able to do in life is really look for that place of empowerment. What is my role in this? Can I change how I'm thinking about it? Can I do something different in the moment that will help me get to the space emotionally where I want to be? So, so let me ask you, if you, if I said to you, there's another strain of COVID coming and some, and I said, and people are anxious, would you tell me that makes sense or does it make sense? Of course it makes sense. It makes to be sense anxious. to me. <laughs> Could yeah. we could we deem that an appropriate and reality based response to the situation? Yes. Yeah. Of course. Okay. So you don't want to wipe away a realistic emotion. It's the it's the appropriate emotion for the situation. 
what you want to take a look at is, okay, the idea of that causes me or leads me to feel anxious. How am I thinking about this? And is the way I'm thinking about it driving up my anxiety or decreasing it? So if I'm doing the whole, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I can't believe this. You know, it's never going to be okay. It's never going to end. My but- kids are going to move back in with me again. <laughs> Right, right. If we're doing all of that, what direction is the anxiety going to go? Up. Up, correct. If we looked back at the evidence that, yeah, there have been strains of COVID, and yes, we got anxious about it, and as time has progressed, have we moved through that? The majority of us, or those of us sitting here, could say, yes, we have. Uh, Was it uncomfortable? Yes. Was it upsetting at times? Yes. Did I uh, come through that and am I here and am I okay right now? Yes. And so the evidence is there that we can get through very upsetting and uncomfortable things and still be okay. And I think we have to like, how would I phrase it? We have to renegotiate our relationship with emotions and, and with anxiety. That's part of what makes humans humans. So we want to be able to sit with things that are unpleasant. So when I think of emotions, I think of them in terms of um, not positive and negative, but like pleasant and unpleasant. And everybody has all of them. And so we have to work on our relationship with different types of emotions. And sometimes if we look at the facts of the situation in relation to ourself, that can be helpful. Wow. So interesting. It is. It's just because it... Literally, the first time she and I had this conversation, it really shifted my perspective. Once you say that anxiety isn't bad, but how you approach it and or how you feel it or at what level, it all of a sudden everything's changed. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't gotten there yet, but I will. I promise. The key (laughs) is in how you're... um, Part of the key is in how you're thinking about things. So if you say to yourself, you know what, there's going to be another strain of COVID um, and that's upsetting. I know we've had different ones in the past and it's being worked on and we're coming up with medications and whatever it is that you say that's fact-based that helps you, that will shift the intensity of that Mm -hmm. emotion. I think what's hard is often people are focused on things that they're powerless over. So they're focused on the change. Having- well, that was on my list. Oh, okay. That, that was on my list. <laughs> yes. When you get out of a routine mm-hmm. in your life, whether mm-hmm. you're getting a divorce or someone's passed away and you have to mm-hmm. move, I see in my job a lot of those scenarios. Yep. And um, Or you just somehow get out of your routine. You have holidays and things are different than your normal and it causes anxiety a change causes anxiety until you realize that you're going to you're going to get back into a different routine it might not be the same routine but you're going to get into another routine i see a lot of change causes anxiety change is uncomfortable for most people how we're thinking about that change is playing a major role in how you're experiencing the emotions related to it. So if I'm focused on things outside of myself, like the change having to be in another person, like, um, I don't know if you ever thought to yourself, if this person would just stop doing that, I would be fine, yes. you know, yes. or, or the situation, right? If, if this situation would just go this way, because I know this is the better way for it to go, if everybody would just listen to me, I would be fine. Well, that's rendering ourselves powerless it is more helpful and more empowering to think this person is this person. And so I'm going to accept, I may not approve of it, acceptance and approval are totally different, right? Approval is I want it, I like it, I would choose that. Um, Acceptance is it is, and so it's fact-based. And so if I say, this is who this person is, then I can readjust how I react and respond to it, what my expectations for that human 
would be. So I might think to, I have a 30 year old son. So I might think to myself, my son should, there's that magic word, right? We can't should all over other people because we don't get to say <laughs> what they do and what they say. Right. We shouldn't should on ourselves either. But um, we, can't, we can't tell them that. So what we know is um, if let's say our child is always late and we know that, and we're like, you should be on time. You need to be on time. Might we enter parent lecture mode, whatever it might be. They're still going to be the person they are. So we can decide, okay, this is who he or she is. Now, I'm going to tell them to come 15 minutes earlier every time we go do things or whatever it might be. That's what I do for my husband. I'm going to modify. <laughs> uh, yes, you I modify. I do. He's always late. You modify your, exp your behavior to improve the situation. That's you empowering yourself. And that's ah. just kind of an example of it. But I challenge like everybody to think to themselves in a day and catch themselves how often they are focused on the change having to rely outside of themselves. It's going to drive your anxiety up. So in other words, your, your boss is saying this or that to you on a regular basis and it makes you crazy, but instead it could be something that you maybe decide that you're just going to not not let that bother you. I'm just trying to find another example outside of like what someone else is doing because there are so many people that are around us on a regular basis that we can't we can't change them. Well, we have no control over any of them. Um, actually, we have no control over really any anybody else except for ourselves. That's where um, change comes from within, right? And so in your example, like if your boss is saying things to you and they say it over and over, um, you, it may bother you. I don't think you could tell yourself, don't bother me. You know, it may bother you, but when it comes in and that bothered feeling would be automatic. So you're not in control of it. But when you recognize the feeling, you say something to yourself like, that's who that person is. That's who he is. That's who she is. That's who they are. Mm -hmm. That type of thing. The kinds of things that stress me out on a regular basis is making appointments and trying to get members of my family to do things. And what I'm working on is trying to let go of it being my problem. Because once I say, hey, I think you should have this physical examination, or I think you should go get it, get on the TSA pre-check list, or do, I would like to see that happen, but we're talking about other adults here. And I'm not everybody's administrative assistant, but it's still stressing me out if they don't make the call or if they don't show up for the appointment or if the job interview doesn't get set, set up on a timely manner. So, so so let's identify the distortion. What word did you use that? I don't know. What did I, oh, I use? You said you should. Yeah. You should yes. do this. You should do yes, that. You're right. Well, I should all over them. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe here's the thing. Maybe they should. Maybe they shouldn't. But they are not. Right? right. But they are not. And that is the important part. So you could have a conversation, right? And say, um, you know, from my perspective, I would like for you to do this, right? I would like because um, they're adults. So I would like for you to do this. And these are the reasons why. And I would like for it to be accomplished by this date. But you have no control over whether that happens or not. And if they don't, the person that will struggle with the consequences related to that is them. Is them. And the, uh, with mindfulness techniques, thoughts come in. And what we know is we don't need to embrace or dance with every thought that we have. We have so many thoughts in a day, and many of them aren't productive or effective or useful at all. And so when we practice mindfulness, we learn for those thoughts to come in and those thoughts to go. Um, well, I just something just popped in my head. Um, uh, Eden and I used to work out together, and we used to do planks. Yes, they're horrible. Um, it, it, yes. And... Um, I could stay forever because all I do while I'm in the blank are mindfulness strategies. So those thoughts that come in that are like, you can't do this, you're dying, you know, this isn't mm -hmm. working. I, those come and those go. And all I do is speak to myself in a way of this, I am comfortable, mm -hmm. I am strong, you know, like whatever I would say to myself. Or sometimes I'm just what I call in the zone and I'm not saying anything. You know, one of the things, Glendy, that we talk about on this show often is how different Christine and I are. And whereas you, most of the people you talk to are more concerned about change, 
I love change. Mm -hmm. Like I'll change something up just to change it because yes. I just love change. And I'm the total opposite. Yes. I hate change. I I like a routine. Right. I um and I'm comfortable in my own skin in my own routine. That's why we encourage people to use the term I, because what's going to cause you anxiety, or I, I shouldn't even say cause, I should say what will lead you to feel anxious is completely different than what would cause Eden to feel anxious. Oh, well, anxious. we already know that. Yeah. But that's, Im <laughs> that's important for when we are listening to what's going on in the world. When we think about these things about why, uh, how people will react and respond, we usually believe the world's gonna function the way we function. Um, and I'll give an example of that. But truthfully, we really need to just listen. So when somebody is saying, this is what's happening for me, this is how I'm feeling about it, we wanna take that in and just be with the person. That's literally the difference between empathy and um, sympathy is like, empathy is being with the person in their feeling, not having our own thoughts of, why, what, and you used the term fix earlier, and that's one thing I often talk to people about. We are not fixers. First of all, human beings are not machines, so it's not like we're swapping out parts um, and things like that. What we wanna do is take it in and empathize, and then maybe like summarize, like let the person know we heard them, right, that we're listening, and then let the person talk more. Um, but we don't have to, and I think, you know, we see this a lot with a, a lot of people, but we definitely see it in women over a certain age um, that maybe have adult children now or have raised children or even have um, just sort of been that person to their friends or significant others. And they view themselves as the fixer. A, a strong thing that plays a role in that is many of us find it very difficult to manage when people we care about and people we love are having specific emotions. So our attempt to assist subconsciously, that's also to improve our ability to cope with what's going on for them because it's hard for us to see them in distress or whatever it might be. And so like, here's an example of that. Like if we're dealing with kids that are young and we say something like, if, if they say somebody was mean to them, let's say, or, or whatever, or if uh, our spouse says something happened at work and we're like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, that person's just like that. That literally sends the message, don't feel. So we don't really want to respond to people that way. We want to let them feel and provide them with the space to be able to do that, that is safe and comfortable and supportive. Ah, it's interesting. Very. There's so much to this, but what I'm really, what I'm hearing is that a lot of things that we are anxious about are natural things that you should be anxious about, or you may be anxious yeah. about. However, how we process them, how we act on them, yes. that is where we can make changes and only to our own emotions, yep. not to what somebody else is going to do or feel. Exactly, exactly. And you can find, like, if you Googled thought distortions, you would see the list that comes up on there. And there are a lot of the things we talked about today, personalizing things. When people say things, it's not necessarily always about us, even though our brain very often attaches it to us. That's going to affect how we react and respond in that situation. If we separate ourselves from it and hear it from the person who's saying it about whatever they're saying, our reactions and responses will be different. All or none thinking is very difficult and many people have that. At times you'll hear people refer to it as black and white thinking as well. Um, our world is a giant, giant gray area. So it becomes very important for people to be able to manage. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> She sets alarms all the, time. all the time. I've never seen anything like this. Me, I, I never set alarms. She said it went off at lunch. We were eating. <laughs> Her alarm went off. I'm like, what's the alarm for? It's one of the coping strategies that I highly encourage people really? to use. Actually, yes, because a lot of what well, can my cause also can never find my and phone. she can never find her phone. And I mean, never. never. Two hours ago, she couldn't find her phone. <laughs> 
a lot of um everyone out there this is the difference between me <laughs> and eden just in case you wanted to know up oh, she it. found it <laughs> um, i'm gonna leave all that in this podcast just to show just, to show. Some just of them, so you know what my life is yes, like that's with so these. funny that's it we're constantly interrupted right but really people use that to cope Yes, and I was gonna I was gonna explain that because you know uh, short term memory issues related to that start around age thirty and like it just the decline happens from there and so like even if I'll ask people in their fifties let's say um, any memory issues that and I would always phrase that as any issues any memory issues that go beyond the natural decline that we expect right like why am I why am I in this room like oh, well, that's normal. where's where's my umbrella <laughs> my water day. bottle whatever it might be but one of the things that drives anxiety up a lot for people. As you were saying earlier, because of lack of predictability or the unknown, is not really having good time management, organization, and planning strategies. And so that becomes, <laughs> yeah, that becomes critical. And so when I talk with most people, whether they're in my personal life or I'm doing it professionally, one of the very first things I encourage people to do is to use a calendar planner that is like on the half hour or on the 15 minutes and really start putting things down there and having them look at it and be like, okay, so you, in the morning you did laundry and then you got ready for work and then you did this, and like, so where's the transition time? Like there's not even a five second transition time in there or where's the travel time for where you had to get from one place to the other? And so a lot of times our emotional distress or anxiety is related to unrealistic expectations for self. We have overestimated what we are capable of doing. Just we're human beings, not human doings, you know, so we have to remember that part. Wow. There's a lot. There's a lot to process. <laughs> and we could probably do entire episodes individually. <laughs> Sessions, I believe they call them in your business. Yeah, there we <laughs> but, but hopefully what everybody took away from this, and this is what I took away from it, is that we, we all have different reactions to situations. We all approach things differently. And, and that's what makes this world a beautiful place. Thankfully, there are people who are here put on this earth, born into managing it and helping us learn and grow and function and thrive. And so Dr. Gwendy Cohen, we appreciate you being here today and we hope that you'll come back because we obviously have only skimmed the surface and I'll set an alarm to remind you <laughs> to come see us. But in the meantime, if everybody would subscribe, leave us a, a review, give us five stars, whatever is asked, believe it or not, science and the internet say that that's helpful. We don't pretend to understand it. No, we don't. No, we don't. But until next time, we invite you to let it go. And don't look back. Oh. And don't look back. Oh. And don't look back. Oh. And don't look back.